up, mediums? Welcome to The Writer's Journey. I'm your host, Lauren Moore, and with me is the phantasmagoric Kayleen Williams. We're two authors on a journey to learn more about writing with you, the audience, so thank you for joining us. This episode of The Writer's Journey is brought to you by The King of Cydonia, written by Richard Fox and moi. Tonight, we're talking about leveraging the power of words on the page and spoken. Our guest is a history professor, MFA creative writing instructor, and a science fiction and fantasy author based in Nashville, Tennessee. Between his 31 titles, he's got something to thrill, entertain, and make you cringe in horror, guaranteed. Tonight, the professor's holding office hours. Terry Maggart, welcome to the show. Hello. I'm very happy to be back. And looking fly with your also <laughs> retro shirt. Let's show off shirts. We showed off shirts before shows. So. Yes. Three company. And I've got, of yeah. course, Keystroke. And let's just enjoy that one a little bit more. The Keystroke? Or the only thing it's missing is the pencil. That's it. They should just like have a little pencil down there at the bottom. It's got a floppy <laughs> disk. Uh, VHS. And a tape Once tape. upon a time, they could save or destroy the world. Oh, yes. We would sit with bated breath waiting for the DJ to play our song so that we could record it. Yes, yes. On, know, sitting in front of the radio and oh, yeah. play record. Yeah, and then they would talk over it. <laughs> Just, I'm re-riling. I can't talk about it. <laughs> but never forget, right? That's no. Says. <laughs> yeah. Never forget. All right, well, speaking of never forgetting, last time you were on the show, we were talking about pacing. It was a really fun episode, and it went by quick. Yes. <laughs> and we were... You were talking about, uh, you brought up critical spacing, and I thought, let's get it back on the show just to talk about critical spacing, what that is, why it's important, and then how can we use some of those ideas and apply it to audiobooks. So um, what is critical spacing, and why is it important? Um, crit so critical spacing is based on how the reader perceives your book, mm -hmm. and, and also you know, keeping their interest. Um, and I think anybody who is a professor or a teacher of any kind knows you can't teach for 55 minutes unbroken. Um, you have to do it in small blocks and such. So critical spacing is the idea that you wanna make it visually appealing on the page. You wanna have it not huge long blocks of uninterrupted text because you're gonna lose, at some point you're gonna lose the reader. Yeah, your eye will get very tired. Just yep. here's another black box and another black box. Yep. yep. <laughs> so maybe in the 1800s, we had the attention span for those long chunks. But you're saying shoot for shorter paragraphs? Um, yeah. And also it encourages you to use dialogue. It encourages mm -hmm. you to one of the most critical components <laughs> of any author toolkit is going to be sentence variation in terms of you know, you don't want to have 13 sentences in a row with nine words each because the repetition is just mind numbing. Um, so you're going to, it causes you to think spatially, to think not just in two dimensions, but in three dimensions. How is somebody perceiving this as they read it? What does it look like to them? And does it keep them engaged until the end of the page? So it's almost like creating a picture of the words themselves. Absolutely. That's a great, that's a better way to say it. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> All right. And I'm done. I'm leaving. <laughs> so I guess that's most important when you're starting out a chapter or when you're ending a chapter. Both. Um, both. Yeah. You're, Lauren, you're right. Um, both. Um, there's something interesting about the structure of books is that there's these little, uh, you know, the little fancy things at the beginning of a chapter that we call those florins. Um, mm -hmm. And a friends, it serves a purpose. It breaks up the visual construction, but also like having the, if you start off once upon a time and you have the O a lot bigger, it's all that's fancy. Really. absolutely. Um, that goes to book structure. That's critical spacing. That's part of the physical component of the story that you're trying to tell. Now in the middle of the chapter, dialogue, of course, creates these nice visual gaps that you can see and that's really appealing to the human eye because you look at it and it also creates what I call staccato, you know, where it's like, bap, 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 bap. it's really appealing the back and forth 
for us because it keeps us fully engaged from sentence to sentence all the way to the end. Well, you're trying to get the reader into the flow, like to yes. experience that um, timelessness where they're just in, in your story. And if they're going through your book quickly, like they're physically turning the pages quickly or swiping quickly, then they're more in that zone. And if you have more white space, you do that. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, okay. So how can we do that if outside of dialogue in prose? Um, Okay, last week or two weeks ago, when I was fortunate to be with you, I mentioned a term called the velvet hammer. Um, the velvet hammer actually has two iterations. One is at the end of a vignette or a chapter or something, you have one short, punchy, really impactful statement. Um, it can be as little as two words or as, as six words, but it's generally a short sentence that really wraps things up and gives this visceral gut punch to the reader. You can do the same thing in terms of describing the world in the middle. Um, and what that's what I call it, um, you can use the rule of three, where you bring three things. Like you would say, he saw the dog, short, wiry hair. It was disinterested in him. One, two, three. And those all lead each other. Um, and there's not this long soliloquy in, in the middle of it. Um, I think stylistically, that's a really appealing way to approach a chapter. And it also is wonderful for world building without boring people with too much explication. Can you do too much of that though? Where, yes. you know, you you have your, um, like your long your longer paragraphs and you're trying to break them up so it's not just like half a page of a single paragraph and you end up breaking it up, it looks like a blurb. Like the new blurbs yeah. where it's just yep. like one line, one line, one line. Yep. I, I'm not a fan of that. Um, but then again, I'm a, I'm a fan of ad copy. I think effective ad copy, you only get one opportunity. It's like, you know, Tinder for readers. You only get one opportunity to sort of hook them. Um, and don't get me started on the importance of cover art, but, um, yeah, I think you can do that too much. I think you can break it up so much that there's no flow. All right. So, so definitely keeping it to, you know, it's a, it's a dance. It's a dance of the words. You're creating yeah. an image. You don't want it to be three lines. You know, it's pop art. You know, don't do this. <laughs> yes. Uh, there was, I mean, way back in the 80s, um, there was this literary trend led by certain authors who were, they were sort of quasi-experimental and they would write like that. You know, it was very fragmented and I could never enjoy it. And I... I say, write what you want. You know, I'm not here to be anyone's mentor in terms of stylistically telling you don't do this, but it was very difficult for me to get into it. Once again, sentence variation, you can have three or four short punchy sentences and it's beautifully capped off with a long sentence at the end. I really like that kind of flow. It's musical, it's lyric, but it gives you a lot of pleasure to read it, uh, the voice that you're hearing in your head. We had a comment um, from Bill Harris, and he says, Cormac McCarthy oh. is a nightmare to read sometimes. He has these long paragraphs that last a full page, and he doesn't believe in punctuation. Oh, no. It's poor uh, first of all, thank you, Bill. <laughs> Secondly, um, I'm going to give you a, new, a perfect example of what Cormac, what McCarthy did right once. Um, in the novel The Road, uh, there's a particular vignette where it's a flashback to prior to the nuclear weapons falling and man's wife says, now is not the time to take a bath. And he says, yes, it is. As he's filling the tub. Yes, it is three words and you know what's happening. It's a nuclear war. It's the end of the world. Three words. Mm -hmm. That kind, that is the velvet hammer right there. To, to mm -hmm. me, that was a beautifully executed sentence. Perfect in construction, perfect in the scene. But I'm also in full agreement with Mr. Harrison that uh, McCarthy is uh, challenging at times to read. Uh, well, beautiful, had, but challenging. You had a really heavy paragraph coming right before it, and then there's that tiny little, yes, it yep. is. Yeah, I can see how that would have a lot of emotional impact. Um, now, what about on the author's side, when you're writing this draft, T.S. Hoddle says, sometimes I have trouble getting the characters to shut up long enough to reset the scene. Um, Sure. So when you're drafting, you're just trying to get the words out 
are you really thinking about sentence structure and sentence length and varying it up? Um, are you putting that on yourself during the initial draft stage? Or is that something you're coming back in later during the revision stage and working through? Um, personally, I, I do. I mean, I think about it all the time, or, or I should say, as I've written almost 2 million words at this point, and it is now uh, auto, it's autonomic for me where I, I think in terms of the complete story arc. In other words, when I think of an idea for a story, I've already structured it in my head. Um, one of the things I will never have is too few words. So I, I, I'm never worried about word count. However, structure is something that I strongly encourage you to get right the first time because it's extremely difficult to go back and fix. You can fix and tweak and change dialogue and make it crisp and things like that. But if you have a flawed principle, um, if your columns that you're building the house on are bad, it's much more difficult later on. Uh, so. if, if you are an author, say you're a new author and you know that your sentences use the same kinds of sentences a lot, you know that your sentences tend to be the same length. You just Maybe you've gotten feedback from someone saying, um, this is boring, bearing up your sentence style, but you don't know how. Um, what would you, what advice would you give to that author? Um, well, you're going to, first of all, you should never stop reading. Hmm. Um, and if you get in a rut, uh, I have a friend of mine, I love her dearly, but all she reads is Viking romances. Uh, you know, she's, she's just, she's probably read 1500 of them. And that's great because she's reading and all I care about is literacy. But if she had to write a book, you know what it would look like. It would look a lot like a Viking romance. I encourage you to take in media at all times, sometimes things that are against your nature um, so that you'll see people who don't write like you. Um, I think that we should be a sponge. And the more that you absorb, the better you're able to construct your own worlds out of what you've seen and your own personal experiences. You know, that, that is a really good point. You know, a, a lot of authors, they're trying to bring in like little bits from different genres, you know, sure. like a little bit of mystery. I want a little bit of romance, but it's definitely a full sci-fi or definitely a full fantasy or whatever it is. Um, but it's like, but how do I structure, you know, a relationship between two people in this world? Go read a romance, you know, sure. find, find a romance, maybe a vampire romance. If you're writing fantasy, at least it's something... Yeah in a paranormal world. Um, but yeah, I or, agree. Or, or better yet, just look at humans. I mean, just there's the, you can write a relationship as long as you understand humans. And we don't, uh, there are very few people that can truly say they understand humanity, but you have enough experience with humanity. Um, one of the great litmus tests for any story is, can you take this romance and drop it into outer space and it does it still work, you know? Or is it a mystery if you put it on another planet? Is it just a mystery on another planet? You know, that's one of the little tests that you can do to see about the um, if the mesh is there, if all your gears are working together in terms of the structure of the story. The viability? Absolutely. Um, you know, <laughs> oh, yeah. No, that's a great word. Um, you know, sometimes they're dead on arrival if you have a fatal flaw early on. Um, and you'll hear heated arguments about insta-love. Do you have to have a happy ever after? Um, I actually, you know, I teach in an MFA, and one of the things I tell everybody is, if you want to understand the structure of the modern romance, you go to the year 1972. You'd look up the first modern romance that was ever written by Kathleen Woodwiss. It's called The Flower and the Flame. And every romance since then follows that structure. And there's variations upon it, but that is the first modern romance by what we know as romance. Um, and it, they have branched out wonderfully since then. So, um, but that's just a great tool for writers in your kit to say, what is the art romance? I should read that one and compare it against Pride and Pudges. Oh yeah, oh, that's, yeah. Because <laughs> that would be my model, but in space, yeah. right? With adventure and pew pew and explosions. Lots of yes. Um, so going back to critical spacing, we talked about three different ways that we can think about how your words look on the page. We talked about uh, dialogue and having extra white space there. We talked about the velvet hammer, having paragraph chunks and then like a short punchy sentence. 
particularly at the end. And mm -hmm. we talked a little bit about openings, the openings of the chapter and, and the way that looks at the start. Are there other ways we can think about critical spacing in our writing? Um, I think that th this is a question of uniqueness of the author. I mean, there are people who are going to sit down to type that will think of a, a of how to construct their story in a physical sense that I have never considered. And I love that. Um, I occasionally open up a book and I say, wow, this is intriguing. You know, and that still happens to this day. So there is fresh snow out there that someone has not walked on. Uh, there is something out there that's new. Um, I would not presume to tell somebody how to do something beyond the basics because everybody is going to do their own thing anyway. <laughs> um, and, and I'm glad for that. Um, you can get good advice about certain things like grammar and dialogue and things, but then you're actually processing it through your own hardware. Right. And, and you're going to write the story that you want. People are endlessly inventive. I, I, I give credit for authors because I will read something like a Viking romance and I'll say, huh, it's a time traveling Viking romance. You know, something that's new, uh, relatively new. Uh, so to a certain point, I'm comfortable giving advice about that, but beyond um, the basics, I would like to see how people solve that problem on their own. And maybe it's a kind of thing where like now that you're thinking about it, uh, now that we're thinking about critical space, we can look for it when we're reading. Oh, it, it's it, um, the Bider meinhof effect. You know, like you go and buy a blue car and all of a sudden you see blue cars everywhere. Yeah. Well, this, this is what is happening with when you start thinking about spacing um, and you start writing dialogue, knowing that you're going to have your dialogue in audio books, mm -hmm. you will you will write differently. All right. That sounds like a good segue. Uh, but before we leave uh, the way it looks on the page, I'm just going to check, <laughs> check our questions. Oh, yes. How does spacing change or help the story? Uh, it, well, as we mentioned, um, as uh, I should say, as you mentioned, spacing can kill a story by not having enough spacing. Um, I'll give, just briefly give you a great example. One of my life goals was to see the Book of Kells. The Book of Kells is, a li uh, is in Trinity Library in Dublin. It was written in the year 805. It's a Bible. It does not have positive critical spacing. <laughs> it is just <laughs> enormous, giant pages with no spacing. Um, it's beautiful to look at, almost impossible to read. So can it kill a story? Yes, it absolutely can. Good spacing can make your story do two things. One, it can make it flow and make it. The other thing is if you're an indie and you have good spacing and a crisp interior and good formatting, you look like a real pro. And how do you get that in your books? Um, I, I think very cinematically. I, I tend to think and write cinematically. Um, I think in vignettes. I think about my story arc and these little measurements along it of all these things that are happening. And I think to myself, do I really want a 4,500 word chapter? Probably not because that doesn't work for me. So most of my chapters are very punchy. It keeps the pace going um, because I want people to be invested and invested from chapter to chapter. So what length are your chapters? I have had chapters. Uh, well, I'll give you an example. Sometimes I write chapters that are 750 words, but in between them, there'll be a blurb like a, um, like a diary entry or a 911 call where a vampire has attacked somebody. Oh. Or I, I use multiple different media brought in um, to sort of break up the monotony of it so that you're always saying, what's next? Neat. Yeah. Neat. So like what, what genre of story would that be set in where you're using that? Like, oh, I, so I had a, like urban fantasy. I had an urban fantasy story where like one of the things was a letter written by an angry woman to her, to her cousin. And he said, uh, and she said, you know, I've heard that you're spending money and I'm coming down there to, with the truck to get the trailer and et cetera, et cetera. And it's an angry letter. And then you realize as you're reading the letter, this guy's dating a succubus and he's dying. 
<laughs> and, and you can see it, but you know that the person writing the letter doesn't know it. And that's just a nice break from the novel. And it augments the story. It's world building without actually being in the story. Um, I like the creative. Eye. All right. Um, so we talked about how short chapters work because they keep the, the sure. scene moving. Uh, what about long chapters? Do long chapters work and why? They do. Um, I've, and particularly for high fantasy. I think historical fiction and high fantasy can withstand the structural weight of long chapters, um, especially if there's an expectation of the world. In other words, if, if it's this really involved fantasy world with Fae and things like that, it's okay to have long chapters. They work and people sort of enjoy them. That's true. There's, yeah, there's it to me, the different genres, they have different weights, you know, like, like, a, yes. like a, like a high epic fantasy, you know, those words, they are heavy. You know, you are, you are getting a like double chocolate pound cake mixed with, <laughs> like cheesecake topped with double fudge, you know, it's just good to eat it all very slowly. Right. <laughs> um, you know, but then, you know, like some of the other genres, but uh, like military sci-fi is, you know, that's more like a, like an angel food cake and some little lighter, you know, cause it, get in there, get out the fast. Yeah. You um, get a sugar rush. It's fast. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. There's, and that also goes to the expectation of what words you choose, you know, your, your language level has a lot to, if we tend to associate it with certain genres. That's true. All right, so in a moment, we're gonna get into writing with audiobooks in mind, but first, a word from our sponsor. Do, do, scrolling, 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 scrolling. This episode is brought to you by The King of Sidonia, by Richard Fox and our very own Lauren Moore. A peaceful planet under attack, one king stands in the way. A year after the invasion that almost destroyed the planet, Sidonia has rebuilt with their new king and queen at the vanguard, but the marriage entered into to guarantee an ally and stability for the nation is fragile. Love is not as simple as signing your name on a document, and the new queen has a mind of her own. Now, terrorists are infiltrating the capital, and the death toll is rising. King Vincent is overwhelmed, and the queen feels overlooked. When she decides to call it quits, she runs straight into an enemy plot. The King of Sidonia is a space opera filled with action and adventure, clean romance, and an exciting conclusion to Cosima, Cosima, sorry, and Vincent's story. Click, buy now! Oh, that name! <laughs> of doom. Of doom. Yay! All right, so uh, let's talk about audiobooks. Um, they're kind of hugely important for, for authors these days, and we're thinking definitely rising. Um, so let's discuss audiobooks and why the future is now. Uh, I've been an evangelist for audiobooks for ever since I started writing. And, and I wrote with the intent that everything that I wrote was going to be an audio, period. Um, the market is growing so drastically and look at the millions of titles. A, a great comparison is just look at the millions of titles of books on Kindle versus hundreds of thousands of titles in audio. So you've already so, got an advantage. By the numbers, the smaller. Absolutely. Um, and, and also I like Audible's um, their payment structure. Uh, with with Amazon, you know, I often think about buying a book, but kind of talk myself out of it. <laughs> yeah. So I can it can go by months before I'll buy a book on Amazon. Whereas with Audible, you know, it charges me subscription every month, so I'm I'm in, I'm locked in to to paying every month. And then instead of feeling bad about it, I actually feel kind of good. Like, oh, I've got a credit, I can spend the credit however I want. Yeah. And I don't know, maybe I'm being played. I don't know, but I am enjoying it so far. I'm enjoying the experience. So, I would also, I mean, as a PSA, I would also mention that Overdrive is the app that your local libraries use. Mm -hmm. And they have thousands upon thousands of free books. Um, and they're wonderful. I mean, they're first run, you know, new releases. Um, it's an app right on your phone. Uh, you can get on waiting lists for really hot stuff. 
Um, there are lots of services out there like Chirp, um, Sky, Skyboat Media, um, multiple, you know, Drip or is it, there's Chirp and then Drip, I think is another one for audiobooks. But um, there are lots of options out there outside of Audible. Audible, of course, is part of the giant, you know, the network of Amazon. But um, at 20 books, I mean, you saw how many reps were there for Audible. Yeah. They're you a know. conglomerate. Yes. Yes. And they are putting enormous amounts of money into cultivating talent and buying up series and buying exclusive content. Uh, I think I can encourage all young or new writers if you're writing science fiction and fantasy, you should be doing so with the intent that it's going to be an audible or audio rather. And I can tell you um, as a, a budding narrator, I'm going to say that um, the musicality of the words really, really does matter um, because there, there are some, um, cause I do the, the Kayleen story time every Monday. I try to at least do it every Monday. Um, you know, and sometimes you run into that, I call them sticky paragraphs or sticky sentences where it's like, I have to stop and I have to really think about, okay, wait, how is this supposed to sound? So if, if, if I'm doing that, then your reader, you know, is yep. reading it and they're like halfway through the page and they're like, wait, what? And they have to yep. go back to the beginning. Um, so yeah, like the, the critical spacing, the musicality of the words, short sentences with long sentences, definitely helps to um, alleviate some of that potential sticky stuff. That's a great term, by the way. That's oh. fantastic. Yay! <laughs> Two in one show! Nailing it. <laughs> so even if you're not intending on going into audio, just writers in general should think about yeah. how your sound. So Terry and Kayleen, you guys are authors. How do you, how do you think about that as you're writing? Uh, to improve your prose, how do you fix sticky sentences? How do you find them? How do you fix them? Kayleen, what you got? Um, what, well, one of the things, if I have to breathe in between the sentence, then I need to make that sentence shorter. So, you know, if I am reading the sentence and the sentence is going on and it's still going, and now there is a comma, and I'm <gasps> and I have to, I need to break up that sentence. You know, it's it's at that point, you know, there's been no mental break to absorb what I've just read, even though it's like that quick with a pair with a period, you know, it's just that one instance of stop that can help, you know, absorb what was previously said. Um, and I always read it aloud, you know, yep. so after like, even as I'm writing things, I've written something and then I stop and I actually, I physically will read it aloud. And if I don't hear, because I am kind of like Terry, like I see it cinematically and I, I can hear this music of, flow with the words and if i can't hear that flow then something's wrong and i just got to keep hacking at it till it does terry i'm an i'm an american i get tired if my sandwich is too big i mean that's so sentences if i'm getting bored in the middle of the sentence that indicates that i need it i need a semicolon or more likely a period i'm with aileen on this absolutely and thinking cinematically means and did i just saw a comment from chuck what did he? Yeah. Papa Chuck says, read your stuff out loud to yourself. Even if you don't perform it like a narrator, you'll still find those speed bumps in the prose. Yes. Absolutely. And you will also key into the sections where the emotions run high, where mm -hmm. there's this moment where you're a writer and you, all of us know this as a writer, where you're like, all the cylinders are firing and you're feeling it. And you write this scene where you might be a really good writer, but there's going to be parts that are exceptional. And that's where the emotional content and the emotional connection is just so vibrant right there. Um, and that is what you're looking for to give your narrator. You want to hand them something because it's like a song lyricist. You know, you want to give somebody something, the singer to work with, give them something to work with. And I've been very fortunate. I've worked with absolutely top notch talent. I mean, you can't get better talent than who I've worked with. And it's so good. I, this is also another endorsement of hiring the best people you can. I was actually listening to, on more than one occasion, this has happened three or four times, something that I had written. And I'm listening to it and jogging or whatever. I'm like, man, this is good. <laughs> I did not realize for a moment it was me. 
that had written it. I thought, wow. And that is the power of the right narrator with good emotional content. Nice. I thought you were going to say the right editor. That, that too. Yes. Yeah. Um, abs- I know when my editor, Jennifer Clark Sell, and I have been together for six years, Jen is, you know, feed into exactly what it is that I'm trying to do in series to series. When Jen sends it back to me and says, she says, this could be better. <laughs> or if she says, this is so good. You know, she, and I know I'm on the right track. I know it. All right. Um, so two million words later, and right from the beginning, we're thinking about audiobooks. Two million yep. years later, what have you learned about how to write a book that will sound good on audio? Uh, one of the first things that I mitigated or that I modified, excuse me, uh, is how many people I have talking at once. That's one of the first things I did. Um, I tend to write cinematically even more so because I'm thinking about my narrator. How are they going to bring this scene to life and how are they going to close the scene out dramatically and keep the interest? Um, I, there's something about the way that I think that translates very well to audio. I, I don't know what it is. I, there's not a word for it. I'm sure there's a German word for it that's like 58 letters long, you know, with umlauts and stuff. But there, there's something about the way that I write that translates to audio because I'm always thinking about. And the other thing is, Aaron Spencer has done all six of my novels in my one series. I hear Aaron's voice as Carly. She is Carly. And I think, and I'm typing something that's very funny. And I'm like, I can't wait to hear Aaron say this because it's Aaron's voice. All right. So one thing you can do is you can kind of key in on certain, certain people who could be those characters. Okay. Maybe you don't yet have a narrator as you're writing your book. Um, You can think about actors or actresses or people in your life or whatever, and kind of connect with them and try to bring their voice. Um, into your prose. Um, what are some other ways that we can make our stories better for audio? Oh, what are some what are some problems that authors mistakes that they often make that would need fixing for to make the book ready for audio? Um, well, obviously, you want to give a polished product to your narrator. You know, um, and this is where the the Venn diagram of being an indie and being a pro kind of match matches up. You have to be a pro, even if you're an indie. Make sure that every book is as good as it can possibly be. Um, and then when they get the material, they look at it and they go, ah, "It's a paying gig that isn't terrible." <laughs> there's this, you know, there's this sigh of relief from them. Um, one of the other things that I've done is. I tell my narrators, um, I don't write in, have you ever read a book where they really overdid a Southern accent where they're like, Hey y'all, y'all come. And you're like, and you can't even read it because it's it's just too broken. Yes. It jars you out of it. Um, well think about your narrator trying to perform that, you know, give him a break. Ty, Ty can't no. Yeah. Say what you know. Like, yeah. It's like, why don't you just write it like I would write it in English, and then I can do yeah. the sound. You know. Yeah. Like, don't make it harder. You can take a twenty-five word sentence and make it southern just by putting y'all. And then yeah, then you don't a lot have of people to, they will yeah. instantly hear in their head. Yep. 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 Okay, so one thing is a little bit of an accent goes a long way. Delivering product. Um, Kayleen, what do you think as a narrator, what makes your job easier or your performance more stellar with the manuscript itself? Ooh, um, okay. I'm probably going to end up repeating myself. Um, it's, it's the sticky sentences, you know, if, um, as I'm, as I'm reading it, I'm, you know, like Terry was saying, I'm looking for what the emotion of that scene is. You know, because that's going to change, you know, it was a bright and sunny day. It was a bright and sunny day. Like, you know, is it going to be bright and sunny or is it going to be bright and sunny? Like what, 
is that emotion. If I can't find it, um, that's that's going to make the tonal value that I end up using um, harder to find. So, and then delivering in that, and and then you know the writer gets it back and they're um, critiquing it, and they're just like, oh, I'm just not really feeling. It's like, okay, well, what's the emotion of the scene supposed to be? Well, this. And it's like, oh yeah, I didn't get that at all. Okay, let me try and. <laughs> work that in, if that made any sense. What about punctuation? You know, British punctuation, they're very spare on the punctuation. They're, the theory is, if it makes sense without it, leave it out. You know, give the reader the freedom to put their own rhythm where they kind of want it. Um, but with the American punctuation, the rules seem more um, strict. You, you just follow the rule. One thing people say is, if you pause it, if you pause there naturally when you read out loud, and Maybe that maybe there should be some kind of punctuation there. Um, but there's more strict rules and they have more commas and stuff. Okay, so what do you think, Kayleen and Terry? What do you guys think about the punctuation divide? Would less punctuation give the narrator, the audio audiobook narrator, more freedom to put in their own rhythm, or would you rather have the rhythm defined by the punctuation and have more punctuation in itself? I end I up ignoring it. Yeah. <laughs> I totally ignore it. Like if there's a comma and I'm reading it and, and, and you know, reading it, you would pause, but speaking it, it it's weird. The comma's in the wrong place. Then I'm not going to pause there. So <laughs> this is a, this goes back to skill as a writer. Um, it, it, take it easy with the exclamation marks, <laughs> you know, um, also, let your narrator try. I, I can say this with complete honesty and certainty. I've never had to send a scene back to my team. In, in, in all the books that I've ever written, I've never had to say, this doesn't work. And that's because I, if somebody yells, you don't use a exclamation mark. You say, he barked, he spat, he shouted. That's the dialogue tag determines your narrator's tone. You don't, you don't put random. And also I have a, a bias against the word suddenly, <laughs> you know, suddenly the room put, became dark. Yeah. You don't, I, I don't use the term suddenly in my writing. And I certainly don't want my narrator to have to use it. I use an interruption. That's where you use an M dash structurally. I'll have somebody be talking and then they get interrupted with an M dash from another person. And the narrator seamlessly transition through that scene from voice to voice without having any problems. Yeah, I feel the urge to write suddenly at the start of my sentences, so I get it. But then <laughs> that urge gets squelched by Ellen Campbell when she <laughs> sends a manuscript and takes it out because it doesn't need to be there. Like no. suddenly she thought, how else are thoughts coming to you? Of yeah. course she suddenly thought, she's thinking. <laughs> yeah. He, yes, God bless Ellen Campbell because she's absolutely right. All right, so our audience, T.S. Hoddle says, you can have my Oxford comma yeah. from my cold, dead, and lifeless hand. And Papa Chuck also agrees. Oxford comma forever. Yes. So yes. There, there was a comment up here um, from, from Chuck. Um, he says, does writing for a narrator... Wait, I might be actually able to show this. Oh, sweet, I can do it. Nice. Uh, it won't stay. Okay, anyway. Does writing for a narrator change any if you're writing first-person versus third-person omniscient? Not for me. And I can say that not for me because I'm... That's a pacing issue. Uh, it doesn't for me because the most important element that I'm considering is the deliver the natural delivery of the narrator that I'm working with. Um, I consider things more than POV, like pitch and timber, the quality of their voice. I know if I'm writing, if you have somebody with a very young voice, um, they are going to be challenged to bring a gravity to it um, in certain scenes. And POV doesn't matter as much as the range of the narrator at that point. Um, now, snark, I will say this, Chuck brings up a good um, first First person, lends itself very well to snark. Snark and first person go hand in hand. So I guess in that sense, yeah, Chuck's right. It, it, there is some, some, there is some 
adjustment that can be made. And that's where the um, kind of like the auditions come in. You know, you, you send a, a little piece, especially if you're looking for a new um, narrator or you've never had one before. Um, you know, you do sort of like an audition, you know, and they read from a script if they're interested. Um, and then you just kind of go through and it's like, hmm, that one sounds kind of delicious. Let's see if they do yeah. well. And, and I would encourage you, I, I'd like to, because a lot of the advice I give is predicated on mistakes that I've made. Um, don't fall in love with the art, fall in love with the compatibility of, of the person. And case in point, I mean, Gabrielle DeCur actually thought I wanted her to audition for me, which is insane. She doesn't have to audition for anything. Um, Aaron Spencer technically auditioned, although she, you know, um, and Julia Whalen did one of my series and I laughed because she said, I'll be happy to send an audition over. And I was, she had just finished doing Gone Girl and then she was going to do one of my books. I said, Julie, I don't think you understand the power dynamic in this relationship. <laughs> uh, so, you know, I'm very comfortable just taking what you're going to give me because I'm, like, so I'm just happy you're talking to me. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So um, I, I think once again, this goes to circle back to the original point where I said, hire great talent. When you hire great talent, they have a malleability and an intuitive response to the material that you're sending them. Um, and the performance generally, it just, you can tell that when they nail it, you can really feel it. Habitat says, I've been told by narrators that they sometimes prefer a first person because it's more like acting a character than narrating a story. Yeah. Kayleen would know more about this than me. So, um, I mean, I could totally, I can totally see that. But if 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 the character that you're first personering, um, I just made up a new word. Um, <laughs> you know, if if you can't get into their head, it's going to be really hard to bring that character to life, um, because you have to be so close to you know who they are, right? Um, but of course, as a narrator, hopefully you can get past that and find the will. Um, but even even in in like the third persons, um, I'm the narrated. Um, gosh, what I just totally lost the word. The not the dialogue, the everything else. Um, I'm I'm still acting that. You know that still has its own character. It still has its own voice, um, which is different from the characters within that voice. Sure, if that made any sense at all. <laughs> No, it, there's a background voice that you use for, for world building and and, and uh, paragraphs and stuff. And then there's narrative voice that you use. And once again, that goes back to the skill of the narrator. You, I, you say narrator, I actually say actor. I mean, these, you know, I mean, I challenge anyone to listen to Ray Porter and not get emotionally invested or Michael Kramer or Gabrielle DeCur or Stefan Rudnicki or I just, well, my new series has Jeffrey Kafer doing it. Jeff. Jeff can do an array of voices that invest you in the character. That's acting. You know, he's not reading anything. Um, and that's this goes back to I'm telling young authors or first-time authors, narrators are great, and I encourage you to get somebody who's professional, but I'm looking for performances. Mm -hmm. And there is quite a distinction between reading and performing. Well, acting and performing, that might be a more accurate word, too. Because narrator, you can use it for you know, writing the prose itself, right? Yeah. Voice of the narrator, whether it's first person or third person, that's still the narrator. So you keep the term separate and it might help you in your brain yeah. when you're writing. I can see how if you're writing for a specific performer, that it might help you to bust through writer's block. Oh. You know, voice yeah. in your head and you help yeah. the words kind of flow. Yep. That is... I don't get writer's block because I keep more than one book at, uh, going at a time. But, uh, you know, I thought about Car Carly, my character Carly relating a story of when she was 11 years old and an eel got in her, her swimsuit at the beach. And, you know, how horrific it was for an 11 year old girl. This She's like, let me tell you something. I almost died. What you don't understand is that eels kill thousands of girls a year. This is known at science. And I was hearing her voice and pacing and everything. And I was dying, laughing, typing it. And the scientist she's talking to is calmly saying, uh, Carly, I don't think you understand. Eels don't actually kill people. And she's like, you weren't there. You don't know. 
So I gave it to Aaron and Aaron already, the cadence and everything was already there because Aaron said, I could tell, you know, you wrote this with me, with her particular style in mind. So, that's amazing. See, that's, hell yeah. that's the synergy that you want in your writing. Yes, yes. That's beautiful. Um, and here's a little practical tip from T.S. Hoddle. When working with a narrator, provide a pronunciation guide. Yes. yes. Yeah. Um, <laughs> if you especially have funky words or even words that you think are common, like coup, you know, has a little P on the end. <laughs> or some, especially if, you know, they're not in that world themselves, they don't maybe normally read that, that genre. Um, definitely provide that because, you know, you're going to have a bunch of coops. <laughs> I heard, I read, or I heard Marine Corps. Oh, Marine, yeah. that's the other one. Uh, yeah. Another one. <laughs> yeah. 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 You don't want a bunch of corpses running around. Yeah. Around the Marines. <laughs> Unless it's a zombie tale, then I suppose. Oh, yeah, then. Awesome. Yeah, give your editor a style guide so they know how to keep the spelling straight and the capitalization straight. And give your narrator a pronunciation guide ahead of time so you don't record the whole thing and then find out that you had the main character's name wrong. Yeah. The whole time. <laughs> that would be bad. All right. Questions. Being, oh, how do you create an audiobook? So how does one go about this? Well, thank you for asking. So, um, so you, like Kayleen is on the inside of this. Um, you know, it, this is about relationships. You can go to acx.com and look through all of the talent that's there and work with Audible. And, you know, you've got your options. You can do royalty share in which you split. Um, you can purchase it outright, which you'll pay PFH per finished hour. Um, some people on the way up, I always said, find great talent on the way up and get established with them. And then you can grow together. I think that's, that's a good model for, for newer writers. Um, but, uh, there's also a lot of wonderful studios out there that do the entire production for you because you're going to hand your book over, negotiate a contract, negotiate a rate, but then you have to engineer it. And very few people do engineering um, unless you're like in a studio. So the engineered product, uh, or to quote Julia Whalen, that's the sweetened tea. That's what she calls it. Um, that's what gets uploaded to the internet. And that's what people purchase. So uh, ACX has some great tutorials that shows you and walks you through. Um, it's not uncommon. To, like I'm with Podium Publishing. I'm with Blackstone. I'm with Skyboat Media. I'm with variety because I have series with different people. Generally, my contracts with them are seven to 10 years. I'm very comfortable with that because it is a long-term investment, uh, this relationship between the narrator and myself. I'm a Texan. Yeah, my own <laughs> relationships. Um, so why do you suggest finding a, a narrator on their way up? And then how do you determine who's on their way up? And That's a I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to name drop here. I'll give you a great example. My friend, Chelsea Stevens. I met her at an event. We started talking. It turned out we both like cheese. We had a lot in common. <laughs> so um, we've become friends and she's a narrator and she just started about 18 months ago and she's done almost 40 titles, I believe. Mm -hmm. um, by the way, it's a really surreal moment. Like we were on our way to dinner in a terrible storm up in Michigan and um uh, the power went out and everything. But in the midst of all this, she, I, she said, you'll want to turn right here. And she was, went into her narrator voice and it's so surreal to hear somebody switch voices. And yeah, sometimes just so, I do that and people are just, <laughs> I'm like, oh, sorry. I, I love that. I love that. So, but Chelsea initially was at a certain rate per hour. And I took one listen to her and I knew that her rate was going to be almost doubled within a year because I have enough experience both as a consumer of audiobooks and as a producer, a writer, that I was like, this is someone on the, on the rise. This is somebody you want to establish a relationship with now so, because she's going to be too busy in a year. So. so probably you're listening in your genre. So you know what kind of voices that yep. really match your genre. And then you found this talent that sound 
did similar to what you're hearing in the other books? I mean, yes. Yeah. Uh, yes. And also there are people out there who are just home run hitters, mm-hmm. you know, like Michael Kramer could narrate a phone book and it would sell for twenty nine ninety five. dollars mm-hmm. um, He narrated one of my stories and I thought, this is the greatest thing ever written. And then I realized it was because he was narrating it. Um, he also narrates nonfiction. So that malleability is something that is to me, the high watermark of the very best talent. Taking notes, taking notes. All right. Um, last question we had, are print books going out of style? Is that what you're uh, saying? What do you think? Well, what do you think? No, no I way. Need hard, I need my hard copies. I need all of them. Of course, they're all too far away. But yeah. I don't know. I, you know, see virtual reality, but I think people are going to be push, pushing back against, some people be pushing back against all this technology overtake, which seems to be in the future, in the offing. I think we'll always love our, our hard books. Yeah. Because. The tactile sensation. Yes. Um, I can't overstate the importance of the smell of books. Mm. You know, if I was going to wear a cologne, it would be vintage books. I'm not kidding. I would walk in, hello, ladies, you know, because it is a fantastic smell. Um, we're very tactile visual creatures, and all of that is combined beautifully, in, particularly in hardback. I mean, hardcovers are just, there's something about them that I don't ever see it going away. And we're seeing the data right now. We actually talked about it out in Vegas. Um, not only have ebooks stabilized, but ebooks dropped a little bit, and hardbacks have started increasing while audiobooks are increasing, which means that the market is getting a lot larger, which is excellent news. I think it's just love for books is yeah. growing. Like just because you start listening to audiobooks doesn't mean all of a sudden you don't love print books or ebooks. You know, you just you're you're into hearing other people's thoughts and other people's stories and, and your mind's expanding through that. And that can just drop an old habit. You know, and, and as a reader, you know, having that house filled with the uh, bookshelves, it's like, oh my gosh, I would need to get another bookshelf. And yeah. People are like, why don't you just get rid of some of your books? Who are you? Get out of my house. Right. Shut yeah. your filthy mouth. Yeah. The door is there. <laughs> yeah. So you're going to get another bookshelf. Yeah. All right. So, um, oh, there was another, let's see, what about read by the author as far as audio goes? What are your thoughts on that? Uh, I know that's a popular word, especially to save, um, save a penny, save a buck. Okay. So I've, I listen to a lot of nonfiction that is read by the author and that's interesting. Um, but it all comes down to the quality. If you have a voice made for mime, you should not be reading your own books. Um, And there is also, and that comes down to, you know, get some outside advice, have somebody listen to you and listen to your recording and say, you know, you're not, because isn't there, what's more frustrating than almost good enough? Almost good enough kills your brand. Definitely want to give it the best chance it has. Yep. Uh, so not totally knocking it. No, you know, no. Some definitely people have your try, make a few recordings. Um, but yeah, definitely, yeah, the gear can 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 make a difference too. Um, oh yeah. So like, I specifically bought a new microphone for narration, so that I would have a cleaner sound. Um, it would be picking up only my voice. You know, I've like, I've, I've developed an area for that. Um, so if, if you're willing to do that, then, you know, it's, it's an investment and it's a skill and I wouldn't cheapen the, I mean, I respect the people who narrate my book so much because they're experts. Well, first of all, they have talent and secondly, practice, and then they're also experts. Um, you know, my cover artist, I was, I made some tragic mistakes in life. I was an art major in college. Um, I'm not proud of it, but, you know, do I want to go back to being an art major and put in 10,000 hours to become an expert at Photoshop so I can do my own covers? No, I would rather write 20 more novels 
and hire somebody who's an expert. And I kind of feel the same way about the idea of saving money by narrating your own books. There are a lot of people who very, very, Neil Gaiman narrated his own stuff and it's fantastic, but he can do a lot of things. Um, I know my own limitations. Um, and so I choose to work with great talent. All right, last question. We had an audience question from ahead of time. Dean Floyd asked, <laughs> can I call you T-Mac? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> oh, you made him speechless. That's amazing. That doesn't happen a lot. And how do you use verbs and the like to convey the tone and vibes of a setting? We, we mentioned this on the Facebook page, but um, this goes back to, I think your word choice has a lot to, it sets the table for the expectations for your reader. Um, it's, you know, purple prose has its place, but it's very difficult to sell it as commercial fiction. And I believe I used for Dean, I used one, you know, do I want to say that the winds were swirling or the winds were vertiginous? They mean the same thing. One is just fancy, you know, so. <laughs> That's a super fancy word, man. <laughs> yeah. yeah. How many people are going to know, like, is something wrong with the cloud? I don't know what's happening with the cloud. Yeah, it's it's an SAT word. And I'm not anti-SAT words because sometimes they absolutely, you know, um, they fit. Like you could say disgusting or you can say noisome. Noisome sounds good too. And it's a little more evil and icky. But not a lot of noisome is not something you'll hear people using in daily discussions. And so I kind of tailor my um, I tailor my desire to be fancy with a desire to write a story that is enjoyable. Hmm. Maybe if you have to be fancy, you'll get a character who just loves big words. And Absolutely. That's your that's your vector right there. That's your in. You get that one guy that comes in and uses, you know, he Purple everything's got big Absolutely. words. Up. <laughs> yep. The other characters are just like, someone please get me a dictionary. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> all right. Well, that's all I've got as far as questions. Uh, what was that? <laughs> that's a cat. Okay. Someone, I need a fancy word for dying in, in Barry's house. There's, it's actually, we have three three legged cats. Nice. So, yes. So. And they have weird aggression issues because they're like, you looking at me because I'm missing a paw? You know, they have. <laughs> so, so, so it's like a gang fight occasionally between the hours of eight and 10. <laughs> so they're all pretty much to each other. <laughs> yep. All right. Thank you so much for joining us again. We are absolutely going to have to have you back on. You know, if there's a topic that you're just like, ladies, we need to discuss this. We're going to be like, when we've got the time and you will be back on. I um, really, really enjoy your, for you guys, I love this so much. It's a great format. I love your vibe and everything. And uh, I enjoy it a lot. So thank you. Oh yes. And before we say good night, um, Lauren here, we have a, uh, oh my God, don't tell me I forgot the word again. It's a sticker. <laughs> well, not the sticker. But, um, Gosh, dang it. We're going to pick a winner. Yeah. <laughs> subjective. Yes, a subjective winner. Okay. Do I get to pick? Of course. If you, oh. If you want uh, to. Shadow the Illustrator. She got oh, Okay, so, okay, let's oh, premise this. Cool is they can't have gotten one already. Okay, so we're going to rewind. Okay. Yeah. So Shadow the Illustrator, Bill Frisbee, um... Do we have a list? We need to make a running list. Oh, unfortunately, the list is only in my head. Okay. So then okay. You, that's all I remember. Um, Ariel Ochoa. Oh, yeah. that sounds new. <laughs> yeah. This, this is Ariel's first time viewing the show. So that is the perfect fan to choose. Yes. So please go on Facebook and message me and let me know. And I'll, I'll need to know where to direct your sticker and send it to. Congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> all right thank you guys for joining us hanging out with us terry thank you for being here Can't thank wait you very much again um be sure to hit the subscribe button ding the little bell so you always know we're gonna have more episodes give us a like right you know let us know that you want to see more of us 
And if you're out there viewing this later and not here live, if you're listening on the audio, you know, come hang out with us in Facebook land on the Keystroke Medium page. Um, because, you know, we're fun people. We like to talk about reading, writing, and everything in between. Right here on Keystroke Mediums, The Writer's Journey. Good night, you guys. Good night.